We went in there, we sold it out, man. All the top young Americans wanted to work for FWA. I was the first one to put my hands up and go, well, this is not English. The rest of the industry was forever changed because of it. This is TWC. We bring you the most exciting action on television, seven days a week on Sky Channel 427. 2004. This is the Wrestling Channel. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, we'll give you your due. We have no allegiances, we have no politics, we have no agendas. We have one, just one criteria, to show respect for the integrity of this sport known as professional wrestling. There was a lot of excitement surrounding the Wrestling Channel when it was first launched. Uh, America didn't have anything like this. America have, you know, globally syndicated television, but they didn't have a dedicated channel purely for all different promotions and styles of wrestling. At the time it was announced FWA would be uh, the exclusive British wrestling provider to the wrestling channel, um, which was, it was great as far as I was concerned because I was involved with FWA. Um, the shows were great. It deserved to have a TV show. Jack Xavier has been studying that tape and oh, straight off the bat! In terms of how it presented the characters and the sort of episodic storytelling from week to week, I thought it was very good. We've got our first in-house guest tonight. He's the current FWA Frontier Wrestling Alliance Heavyweight Champion, a promotion you can see right here on the Wrestling Channel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all across the world, this is Doug Williams. Doug, how are you doing? Hi there, very well, thanks. Appearing on the Wrestling Channel was one of the things that really began the decline, I think, of the FWA. Creatively, it helped us get to the next level of storytelling, but from an attendance perspective, what happened was, when you're doing these once a month shows where it's the best show you can possibly put on, you can sustain an audience and you can build on an audience. When you're taping television, and this isn't what we had experience in, when you're still doing these irregular house shows, but you can't put all your best matches on because now the television, which is weekly, has to build to those matches over time, what happens is you put on a watered down version of the FWA. The watered down version of the FWA slowly but surely erodes what it is that you're delivering, which means less people come. After several months of television, the FWA would promote their biggest show to date. November 13th, the biggest show of the year, FWA British Uprising 3 from the Coventry Skydome. I can honestly say that I've never been so nervous about a show, but I've also never been so excited about it. I think with any kind of excitement comes nerves. I mean, any, all of us in this room can look back at a time when we had something was gonna go on and you thought, if this happens the way it's supposed to happen, this is gonna be big. Despite a major advertising campaign, which included a publicity stunt with professional boxer Danny Williams, British Uprising 3 failed to fulfil expectations. We tried to do something so much bigger. FWA was always about hype and then delivering as best we could. The problem was that we just didn't get enough people through the door for the amount of money that was spent. I believed it so clearly that I was going to sell out that building. Don't get me wrong, it was 1,800 people. It was the biggest house that we'd ever had at that point, and the front row was the most expensive FWA had done. Big expenses on putting that show together in terms of production, and in terms of wage bill, in terms of promotion, wasn't enough. And the FWA didn't have the money. There was no big full bank account, there was no massive sponsor, there was no rich money backer. So that cleaned FWA out, it actually put FWA, FWA into debt. The financial burden placed on all involved proved too much for the company to continue producing a televised wrestling show, and FWA TV ended after less than 12 months. The FWA would eventually fold in March 2007. However, it was clear the company had contributed significantly to the development of British talent. It takes about five to 10 years to really get proficient at something. So if you think about when Hammerlock set up to the kind of period where the Dugs, the Johnnies, the Jodies of this world had become very proficient, the guys who were green in the FWA had now become very good professionals themselves. Guys like Jack Storm, Aviv Mayan, one of the most talented guys I've ever seen in a ring. 2006, 2007, 
that's when we had enough guys to actually start running promotions where the majority of the talent and the great matches would be British. We're in a stage where the likes of Martin Stone, Pack, Joel Redmond, Mark Haskins, those guys there were flourishing and at the same time. We really started to go, wow, we've got like an army of these guys and they're starting. And that's also the point where American wrestling, I think, went, hold on, <laughs> what's going on over here? The wrestling channel then started courting other British wrestling promotions. So LDN Wrestling got a TV deal and IPW UK got a TV deal. And I was responsible for putting the IPW UK show together. Looking back, it was fine, but the money we made was so small, there's no budget for anything, so you have to learn how to do stuff yourself. I had no business whatsoever doing any kind of making of a TV show, you know. Later, RQW got a deal on there. They had the WrestleMania production values, but the fundamentals of promotion weren't there, and the fundamentals of putting together a good show weren't there either. Despite the fact they had a lot of great talent, it was a lot of wasted talent. A lot of great ideas, a lot of great energy, but without the right pieces connecting it together, it's no good. So this is what it's come down to then, the Wrestling Channel Super Show. In 2005, the Wrestling Channel would co-promote a show with Alex Shane. International Showdown, which boasted an array of talent from across the globe, drew three and a half thousand people and was celebrated by critics. However, despite multiple rebrands and the acquisition of non-wrestling content, the wrestling channel would only break even and in late 2007 accepted a buyout offer from the Canadian Fight Network. After barely a year, on the 1st of December 2008, the company's UK venture ceased transmission. I think in hindsight, if it had been a pay channel, it would have made it. It was like a niche product that was given to everybody and the people that would have paid for it got it for free and that meant there was no money coming in. They couldn't afford to keep paying for fresh programming. And without fresh programming, there was no reason for people to keep tuning in because so they ended up airing repeats. And then they ended up cutting the number of hours they were producing. A little bit of advantage in terms of height. And at this style of technical wrestling, that plays quite an advantage. Aside from championing the contemporary British scene, perhaps the Wrestling Channel's greatest legacy is its part in introducing a new young fan base to the world of sports style of professional wrestling. One of the biggest programmes on it, in fact, the exact phrase that Sean Herbert who ran it used was it was the most watched programme by a country mile, was the old world of sport tapes, uh, which you could, it turned out they could just show them, you know, four hours at a time and the audience wouldn't dip even if it was sort of during the day in the afternoon because you had young fans sort of seeing it first time and a lot of the older fans reminiscing. People hadn't seen those matches in years, people watched things like Rollerball Rocco against the Dynamite Kid and thought, good grief, those matches stand up today. It introduced the history of British wrestling to modern day fans because as far as they were concerned, and it was the same when I was watching it growing up, this was an American thing. If you'd watch a World of Sports show, you put that on the TV, it looks like a sporting contest. In some ways, years ago, it was more technical, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, you had more like ins and outs and you worked the holes more. It was obviously a bit kitschy and cool. Like I liked American wrestling too, but my favorite wrestlers were always guys with submission holds and I always liked the intricacy of pro wrestling. Back in the day, you couldn't work out what was coming next, you know, and when someone had someone in a pig's foot armbar, you thought that guy was going to tap. And I know when I rediscovered it, that I was the better for it. How can this be affordable? I watched all the British talent wrestle. Oh my God, it's so much better than what I'm used to seeing. There's so many talented people and entertaining people in this country.